the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Hello to everyone in the room and to those of you joining us remotely. Welcome to this Michigan Academy session with our guest, Michael Herford. My name is Molly Jango. I'm a legal assistant at the firm and I will be hosting today's session. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you all Michael Herford, who is the founder and MD of Legal Lifelines, a criminal law practice with a particular focus on the community and its young people. Michael, I've got a quote. You once said that the law is pervasive and affects everything we do. Law is life and my life is law. So without further ado, hello, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the Michigan Academy. Hello, Molly. Well, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you to yourself and Michigan and those who have uh, taken the time out of their busy days to come and uh, listen to me both in person and online. And I look forward to hopefully sharing uh, more about what myself and Legal Lifelines are doing to try and assist uh, those of the in the community that, that need our assistance the most. So if you could tell us a little bit about your personal background and how you got into the law. I know that your route was a bit unorthodox and I think the audience will be really interested in hearing. So I was born and raised in Bristol, raised by my, my mother, um, a single mum. My, my father is from the, the Caribbean, from St Vincent to be mm -hmm. precise. And I think it's perhaps because my mum was uh, raising me on her own, that she took me to uh, her work, which was work as a community in a community centre um, from a very early age. So I got a, an experience of seeing what happens when people work together um, as part of the community. Yeah. And I think that inspired me to go on to university to get my, my first degree, as it were, in sociology. But there was still something in me that wanted to continue my my vision to try and be uh, a solicitor, even though, to be honest, I had some perhaps some self-doubt, um, which wasn't helped by other people occasionally uh, reinforcing that, saying, well, I don't know if the law's for you, you know, there's, there's easier routes or you could do something else. Um, but I'm quite a, a stubborn person <laughs> and um, I decided that uh, after completing sociology, I wanted to take the plunge and do a law conversion course. Um, which I duly completed, then went off to London for the legal practice course um, and then qualified in the midst of the financial crash in 2008, which wasn't ideal. And many of you will recall there was a, a hiring freeze yeah. and many, many people that were trying to get training contracts often found that they were being deferred and in my case completely <laughs> ignored. So I thought, look, I have to think outside the box. I need to take the initiative. And I was lucky enough to have met someone on the legal practice course that was doing something called the police station accreditation and was ad advising people at the police station, even though he wasn't a fully fledged solicitor. Mm. So I thought this was fascinating. So I decided to go and pay for that myself. Um, when normally, for those of you that don't know, it's something that the firm would pay for as part of your training contract. Uh, and as soon as I'd achieved that, I came straight back to London and started cold calling uh, criminal defence firms um, saying, look, essentially, if you're too busy or you can't get, you know, people aren't, you know, the technology doesn't exist to be in two places at once. So if there's a police station and uh, this listener needs to go to one police station, I would cover the other. Yeah. And I found that actually I was, I was good because people kept saying, no, 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 I want him, I oh, want amazing. Michael Herford. And so from there, it gave me the confidence to then apply to uh, other other law firms saying, look, mm -hmm. I've already got something that you know, I'll be able to add value to your firm. Um, I've got you know, good reviews. I've got a client following. Um, and that really did assist me with getting my foot in the door and getting that magic training contract. Amazing. I think at some point, you actually, when you were younger, you wanted to be a policeman. So when did you decide that actually, no, that's not for me. I want to go into law. Um, in all honesty, I think my dad's got something to do with that <laughs> where he did. <laughs> He did hear that I was um, threatening to be a police officer and he, uh, in no uncertain terms, said, you know, no son of mine's <laughs> going to be a police officer. And, and actually, that is very sad because mm -hmm. what we see is such distrust in the system, especially from the older generation because of experiences that they experience and, you know, things that were fed back from their parents. Um, and I think that's still something, yeah. there's a big problem in the system today where the same things are being said to the younger generation because there is such a lack of 
trust with the police and the system in general. Can I ask, what led you to set up your own law firm and mm -hmm. what services do you offer? Well, once I qualified as a solicitor, and actually I, I missed out a little bit where I, I was freelance for a bit and then I bumped into a, a senior director who was impressed by my client care that I was offering one of his clients and then said, look, you need to join us. So I was able to get a leg up and joined a, a major national firm. Um, so from then, I everything revolved around the police stations at first and I saw such a profound lack of trust in the system by these mostly young people who I think were getting let down um, and I don't know whether that was with the cuts to, uh, to legal aid where mm -hmm. people weren't able to give the service that they would lo like to give, uh, the lack of trust, they, they, it was just awful and I saw a, 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 a a need in the market for a firm to come in and be able to offer accessible legal advice to those in a digestible manner. Why was it so important for you to have a practice that focused on the community mm. and young people? Mm. If you're criminalised at a young age, it has an, a terrible effect on your ability to get a job in the first mm. place. If you have a job, to retain a job, yeah. people often lose their job. And once you're in the system, it's very easy to you know, you, people have to put food on the table somehow and if they're not given the opportunities to, um, to, to live their full potential through education or, you know, getting a trade, for example, then they're going to turn to what they've discovered or what people influence to do, to do which is crime. Yeah. And so it's so important that we invest in our young people's future and do everything we can to support them to, uh, to live their full potential. And there's a lot of frontline organisations, charities that are doing their very best to give that support. But without people joining the dots, people don't know who, who they yeah. are or who's doing what or what their rights or what the law is. And as I said, that where people don't know what the law is, they're making mistakes yeah. at the police station, either through not asking for a solicitor or maybe even sometimes people not taking the time to hear hear out what that person's gone through and t taking the time to gain their trust yeah. and they're being needlessly criminalized which is obviously having an awful effect on society have you found that any particular communities require your services more than others yeah well i've mentioned stop and search yeah. and that's something that's very uh very close to my heart at having experience stop and search quite a few times and yes most of the time it was fairly innocuous mm -hmm. and I was asked where I was going or who, you know what I was doing and I politely answered and I was al allowed to go about my business um, but there was one time in 2007 where I was uh, let's just call it, it it's called in by the police a hard stop where yeah. they come in very hard and a bit like shock and awe and it's normally done against organized criminal so I don't know I hope it was mistaken identity but the point is is that we were almost run off the road and it was me with a group of other uh, law students as it happened but I hadn't done my advanced criminal section but the point is I was screamed at and Goodness. sworn at and, and it was genuinely terrifying, terrifying and it yeah. went on it wasn't just the shock and awe bit to get everyone out of the car safely it was just went on and on and it was truly awful and that was the, that really opened my eyes to what is going on sometimes with um, police that do so much damage to, to community mm. relations. So where in London, for example, you're nine times more likely to be stopped if you're a black man, mm. if you repeatedly come into contact with the police, it, you're much more likely to, be, to enter the system and that's just the law of probability. Um, equally, we've seen through lockdown, uh, you know, other members of society that aren't used to having contact with the police and people saying, look, where are you going? Where, well, you know, where, which area are you from? And we've seen commentators rightfully outraged saying, you know, you can't speak to Auntie Doris yeah. like that. Who do you think you are asking mm -hmm. where you're going? And, and so it, it's, it's something that is the norm within, I would say, the black community. Yeah. And it's something that I've now taken to heart to try and do something uh, about. And what I'm worried about is stop and search actually criminalizing yep. a community where people do lose their patience. And I see it a lot where people are getting arrested and prosecuted for, say, a public order offence, say, swearing mm. in front of a police off officer when there was actually no other offence and it gets recorded as a success. Yeah. And it's like, yep, yeah, that's why we stop and search people because 
it's justified because look at all these offences that we're finding. Mm. And yes, stop and search does have a role. I'm not saying I'm not completely anti it. It just needs to improve in the quality it's, uh, of uh, yeah, the quality of the stops and there needs to be more understanding from both the police and the community about yeah. their rights and it needs to be done in a civilised, respectful manner. So yes, I do, there is a disproportionate number of uh, people from the black community mm -hmm. that trust Legal Lifelines but we're very proud to represent everyone and anyone yeah. uh, that, that trusts us to, to look after them with their case. Yeah. It's funny you say that because so we've actually launched the Black Justice Project which is mm -hmm. a legal advice clinic that's mm -hmm really for the black community and we provide advice and mission to actions against the police and we've actually had a few cases where young black boys have been stopped at the search by the police and for what seems to be for no apparent reason yeah. and you know they just have no idea what their rights are they don't yeah. know what it actually means to be arrested or detained or unlawfully detained mm -hmm. and it's funny because after the death of George Floyd and the riots that followed I myself I've never been stopped by the police but I was actually scared to leave my house you know thinking of you know I might have an encounter with the police so it's, it's quite scary to mm -hmm. think that you know it does disproportionately affect the black community but I mean the work that you're doing is helping but what do you think is actually is required for real change to occur? So I, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement from the police that there yeah. are problems with certain police officers that mm -hmm. are doing untold damage to the majority of police that are in the profession for the right reasons, yeah. who are trying to go about their business, um, keeping people, our society safe. Um, and I think we need to embrace tools when they come about that help, as it were, take back control. I don't like that phrase for... It's got other sort of ramifications, but take back control. So I created something called the Legal Lifelines app, which allows people, and it's free, free to download and free to use. And essentially it's got some three main functions. One, there's an SOS feature where if you press the button, the SOS, you'll either have the option to record what's going on. And it doesn't just download onto your phone, it downloads into a separate cloud, meaning that that evidence is safe and it can't be destroyed mm -hmm. if the phone's damaged or destroyed or if it's seized or you know something happens to it. There's another button in the SOS feature where you can get immediate access to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So you can press a button if you're not sure. There's something called a Section 60 mandate sometimes that comes down. It normally happens if there's been some kind of let's say a stabbing sadly yeah. uh, and there's an area of particular interest where police don't need a reason or reasonable suspicion to stop someone they can just say look I want to search you um, if that happens often people say you can't do that mm. and then they try and some some people resist or there's a problem this would just say we'd be able to explain clearly uh, what a section 60 is and advise people which is um, uh, advice that I've picked up along the way as well um, to comply and to complain. Please don't make it the reason that you're... You yeah. know, give, give people a reason to get arrested by resisting or seemingly obstruct the, obstructing the police. Mm -hmm. And lastly, there's a, a knowledge button where you can press uh, a, a button and the, your rights, if you're stopped and searched, pop up. And it's something that parents, frontline organisations, individuals themselves can just take their time to familiarise themselves with the law. Through our work with the frontline charities and organisations, we find out what the community, the general community and specific communities want to know about. Um, and where there's been, either because of the lack of trust in the system, they, people want to see or understand the law from an independent, trusted source rather than a .gov.uk website or from somebody else that's perceived to be in the system. Um, and so what we do is we commission articles from the best legal minds in the country um, and on specific areas of law that people need to know about or want to know about. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything that's missing, please reach out to us and we'll work, work together to get you um, what you need. I wanted yeah. to find out what your views are on diversity within the legal profession. Mm -hmm. Huge progress is being made. I, I don't want to be miserable Mike saying that everything you know there's no hope there is hope and great yeah. things are happening and there's uh, a lot more being done and people are speaking up to to give back and to inspire mm. the next generation coming through um, but it is a, so when I first joined I didn't have anyone I knew that uh, worked in the sector that I wanted to work and I did try and take the initiative and ask around and see if anyone could 
tell me a bit more about what actually happened and, and I, I wasn't able to find that immediately. So actually Legal Lifelines is also working on building a national platform again to be announced in the coming months where hopefully we're going to provide a one-stop shop for students, um, for everyone but especially from diverse backgrounds to be inspired to hear from the best speakers in the country and to make things more efficient. So instead of just being in the lucky cohort that might be in, you know, in, in, in Birmingham, for example, that might hear a particular lecture or somebody that will come back and give back, in Bristol, in Brighton, all of, across the country, they'll be able to hear from these people, be inspired and then make the necessary applications Amazing. because we're working with other firms and other organisations who may well want to uh, advertise that they're open to um, diverse communities where many, I think, fear at least that the door won't be open to them. Yeah. Is this something that is coming soon, this it's year coming or, or soon. next year? I, I, I would <laughs> like to think that it's going to launch this year. Oh, amazing. Yes. I look forward to that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and I think Everyone has loved what you've had to say and we're looking forward to everything that's coming and I think there's quite a, quite a lot coming. No, well thank you very much. Thank you to Mishcon and everyone who's given up their time today to come and listen. Thank, thank you. you. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com. <laughs>